we won't go round to where Stephen was murdered, out of no. respect to Stephen and yep. the family. Yep. Um, the one thing with this um, murder, it's still unsolved. Yeah. The murder is still out there. So to this day, we don't know who's we, done it. We, we don't know. We don't know. And the family have put appeals out every year. Stephen's mum and dad were putting appeals out till 2020, mm. and we're none the wiser. And this is this is over 30 years. Welcome to another video, and welcome to our channel. Following the staging of the fantastic musical Kids Grow the Bygone Days in November and December last year. Me and Glenn thought it would be really good to go and visit some of those locations that appeared in the show and maybe put together a series of recordings that can be available for generations to come. Dave Waterhouse actually wrote the stage production, so who better to approach and join us on location? Dave Waterhouse. Uh, we approached him and he was more than happy to uh, come along and tell us all his stories. So on this video, this is going to be Murders in Kids Grove. Enjoy. So in the musical, Dave, you did cover a lot of murders. Yeah. And I think you did pay tribute to a lot of people in that musical. And one murder I uh, hadn't heard of is the Villas. What's the Villas all about? The Villa murder took place here at St John's Wood Road, which is opposite the library. We've got the library to the left. The road here, just 100 yards to the top of this road, were two villas. And in 1911, a lady by the name of Mary Weir, a daughter, Margaret, who was only four years old, and Alan Hambleton, who was 17, were brutally murdered by a German by the name of Carl Kramer. And that was just at the top of this road? Just at the top. We'll have a walk up to the top in a second, and I'll give you a bit more information yeah. on what happened. So we're here at the top of St John's Road and there's a villa behind me. Is this the villa, Dave? Actually, no, this isn't the villa. The villa in question was next door, okay? There were two villas at the top of St John's, yeah, and you can see these on the map. But this one was actually, where the murders took place, was actually demolished a few years later um, because of the legacy that it left. So that was demolished. The two villas originally faced onto Liverpool Road because Woodside Avenue wasn't there wow. at all. So when you look at some of the pictures, like I'm looking at this now, this was actually the rear to Villa Number 1, which we can still see on the plans. What happened next door was, once they were demolished, I think around about the 80s, two brand new houses were built on that land where, where the murders took place. Okay, but if we have a walk up this path, I'll be able to show you a little bit more of where Margaret 
and her daughter were actually uh, Mary was buried within the churchyard and tell you a little bit more about how he actually proceeded with the court case. That sounds brilliant, shall we go have a look then? So we're up in the graveyard now, by the villas, and I'm actually looking at the villas now. So how did he actually murder them then, Dave? It was, it was brutal, without doubt, it was brutal. He used a chisel, um, all three had serious wounds to the head. Um, Mary herself had five wounds to the skull. Alan Hamilton, similar. Um, young Margaret, um, had got one to the temple and a fractured skull as well. Um, both uh, Mary and Margaret right. are buried here um, the and the gravestones were here at one point but they've long gone now but all the plans that I've seen literally they buried them both. They're buried right here. They're buried right here in the, yeah. in the graveyard here. Yeah. 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 I, I have a picture at the funeral where virtually all the residents of Kids Grave turn out. There was a week of mo mourning for this. Yep. Yeah. And I've got a picture of this grave here mm. that shows everybody standing. So I do know it was in this area. So they'd be standing here, right, where, yeah. where we were, are. They were standing all within the graveyard because it was full. Yeah. That's incredible. And what I've also found out recently is their father, who was manager of Harecastle um, Colliery, um, they moved here, the Weirs moved here three months before the tragedy their father actually died wow so she was a widow mary Weir was so you know it's it's quite a story it it rocked kids grove yeah. as a community yeah. Yeah. without a doubt mm. so that's an amazing um, how you've told me all that and all the detail so why did kramer actually do it and what happened to him in the end okay kramer was um working at birchinwood his governor as his boss it was a mr lear mr lear moved into the villas a few weeks prior to the incident and kramer out lear to move in kramer spotted a cash box when he was moving in so it's strongly believed that it, the cash was the intention so he was after the money it was, was he? he was after the money yeah without a doubt the one thing with this case is it was done in broad daylight Kramer was seen at nine o'clock in the top ball down Butt Lane having a drink. Before he did the murder? Before he did the murder. Right. Okay. He came up to here, it was round about ten o'clock, and went into the villa, took the money, but as he did the money, took the, was taking the money, he got discovered, and that's when he attacked the three uh, people in question. So they saw him doing it, and then he had to take action. Yeah. He, he had to attack he them. He took action. Yeah. And then after that, what he actually did... He fled. He fled down to the bottom bull, yeah. across to the bleeding wolf. We know from the reports and statements he even had a drink in the bleeding wolf. So he went to the bleeding wolf and had a drink after he'd done all this. He, he did. He did. And then he fled to Doncaster. And then from Doncaster, it took two or three days before we caught up with him, or the police caught up with him, and then he was brought back. To Kidsgrove. So he was actually arrested in Doncaster. Yes. But but back to Kidsgrove, there's a great picture of him arriving at Kidsgrove Station with all the crowds who were there to meet him. He was tried at um, the Victoria Hall, um, where he was obviously found guilty. Wow. Yet, yeah, but then on the judgment, it was found out that two years earlier he'd been in a mental asylum. So the judge actually gave a passing that this bloke was insane. Yeah. And that's why he spent his last years in Broadmoor. Yeah. Um, but that's the story. One of the things that is, is, is shocking for this when you read through the detail, and it's absolutely shocking, is the three ladies that were murdered were kept in the mortuary. And the mortuary, the mortuary chapel, was just in those woods over there. It was just, just here. J just to the just side there. of the rail, yeah. the railings, right in the middle of those woods. That, that's where the, the mortuary was. The bodies were kept in there. So they were murdered here, and we, they were actually kept in, kept the, in, in there. the mortuary yeah. there. Yeah. And what's most alarming for this is that every single one of those jurors yeah. were made 
just look, come across and look at the bodies that right. had, had been beaten, and it must have been horrific. I was going to say, it, it must have been such a mess, it, wasn't it, it after it he'd done? It must have been, honestly. Yeah. After so, he'd done yeah, that. You can't imagine. But yeah, uh, that's the story of, of Mr Kramer. Mr Kramer, yeah. yeah. And they're buried right here? Yes. So today, Dave, you brought us to Bathpool Park, and this is where one of the most horrific murders Kidsgrove has ever seen took place. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it was January 1975. Um, a young lady by the name of Leslie Whittle um, was kidnapped from a home in Highley, which is in Shropshire. On that, at the early hours of the 14th, she was actually brought here to Bathpool. Um, by a kidnapper and what we're going to do today is have a look at some of the shafts within the park to give you a bit of background on Leslie Leslie was known as a heiress um, a father George who owned a coach company a very shrewd businessman 70 coaches millionaire um, he actually passed away in 1972 and he left a lot of that money within that will to both Leslie and a brother Ronald um, which was reported in the paper a number of times and I'll talk on that a little bit later as well yeah. how that all came about so yeah that, that's Leslie Whittle that's Leslie Whittle so now. just just before we do actually leave this uh, particular area can you just tell me a little bit about Donald Nielsen and yeah. how he actually knew the Whittle family okay Nielsen was born in 1936 um, he was uh, from Bradford he um, was ex-military. He was a petty thief, um, small-time burglar, but he never got caught. Uh, over 400 burglaries he committed up to 1972, at which point he needed to, in his words, step up a gear. Right. He was looking for something that would actually make him comfortable for life. He wasn't after £500 a year, he was after he a was big after one. big money. Yeah, and what happened in 1969, there was a woman by the name of Muriel Mackay, who was actually kidnapped. She worked, uh, her, her husband was deputy editor for Rupert Murdoch, um, and she was kidnapped. And he read, it was, there was a book regarding this kidnapping. It was read by um, Nielsen, and he looked at this and thought, you know, this is something I could do. That kidnapping was an absolute catalogue of errors, that kidnapping was. They never found a body. In fact, only this week, January, January 31st, um, a farmer has given permission to search his land um, down south um, to find the remains of this mural's body. So I was doing this this week, and that news coming out, so he actually read that around about 1970, 71, yeah, when he found out about that. So, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more when we go down further, down to the other areas. The other areas. So, shall we take a walk down now to Shaft 1? Where... Yeah, I think if we start at Shaft 1, that's easy. So we're here at Shaft 1, can you tell me the significance of this shaft and can you tell me a little bit more about Nielsen? Okay, I'll start with Nielsen first, mention him at the top, being born in 1936 etc. Um, Nielsen's um, mother, who he adored, died when he was only 10. His father was a strict disciplinarian, um, he got a sister and Nielsen was actually at the age of 10 trans transitioned in to take the place of his mother. He would do all the household cleaning, the cooking. Um, he 
he always felt that the world owed him. He got no friends outside of, well, within school when he was there. Um, he started to be a petty thief when he was 12, 13. He got in trouble with the police at that age um, and later became a, a prol prolific burglar, to be honest. He spent time in the military, two years. He was very, very much, he loved the military. Uh, he met Irene, his wife, around about 19, early 1950s. Um, they married a couple of years later and she talked him out of coming out of the army, which many people say that that was his downfall, really. He got a daughter, Catherine, who was very, very similar age to um, Leslie, only a couple of years between them. Um, he was a failure in everything he did. Except the burglaries, where you know it was accepted, he was never caught. Four hundred burglaries, but he had jobs as a joiner. He was a painter and decorator, taxi driver, window cleaner. You name it, he did it, and he failed at, at everything he tried to get involved. For everything with. he did, he, he he was just a total failure. Yeah, couldn't do he, anything. he was just he, he was just this guy who thought society owed him something. Mm. Yeah, and we'll see later on how some of that change with the publicity he was getting yeah. um, and how, how it actually built up his arrogance to um, to the world really um, and himself. So this, we're looking at three, we're looking at three shafts today. This is shaft number one. This was known in the court cases of Gloriole. Shaft two is 50 yards to my right and a few of the 50 yards just over the bridge there is where Leslie's body was found. Um, there's a, a myth that Nielsen, why did he choose Bathpool? Um, people thought that Nielsen worked on the railway lines behind us in the 60s, the right. tunnels. And the, no, he didn't. There's no evidence whatsoever. But what Nielsen did, and again, it was this military mind that he'd actually got, he disappeared from his wife and child for, for days on end. And he'd go on what he called, said to the family, I'm going on a manoeuvre. Right. He'd pack his tents up. He'd pack his uh, sleeping bag, his cooking utensils, he'd take a few gut guns and he'd go and disappear into the wilderness really, you know, across Lancashire, um, Yorkshire, West Midlands and here in Staffordshire and this was one area he actually visited on one of his manoeuvres. So he did a manoeuvre here in Bathpool? Yeah, he, he was coming, coming down this way and he came across this hole. But I touched on Muriel um, Mackay and the kidnapping that was botched when we earlier, he actually thought he'd planned this um, from 1972 for Leslie Whittle. In 1972, he read in the Daily Express, it was in all the newspapers, that George Whittle had died in 72 and he'd left his family the equivalent of a couple of million pounds. So he thought this is an easy target and he thought the, this family, the Whittles, didn't deserve this anyway because what tripped that in his mind, he saw a piece in the newspaper that talked about his first wife, Selena. Right. And Selena was actually living on two pound a week. She's destitute, really. Um, and he thought that wasn't right. So that ticked the box to take his revenge yeah. out on the Whittles. And that's what happened. So yeah, we're at number one. When we get up to number two, I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, his real name, before I do, was um, Nappy. When he was at school, his name was Nappy. And you can imagine a name that, like Nappy, the bullying he actually got at he school. He got at school, he went yeah. through hell, probably with it. And he did, and he did. So when Catherine was four years old, he wasn't going to put Catherine through that. So that's when he changed his name to Nielsen. Some say he got the name Nielsen from an ice cream van, some say they got it from a taxi company. Um, but that's, that's history. That's what he did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Gloriole, number one. Um, quite significant. He saw this, and what this is is the first part of a complex labyrinth of um, shafts across the area. Um, he saw this and clicked. He planned it all. I now know what I need to do, and that's what he started using. This is quite significant because this case itself is a catalogue of errors, and there's lots of disputes, and I'll talk about a few, but. After that, the bundling of the first um, drop, they, around this area, if it had been searched, they would have found dynamo tape guns, they would have found uh, cameras, they would have found tape recorders that were all in this shaft. All here. Yeah, there was even one flashlight that was actually, it's this gate here, it was 
tape two, and that was when the flashlights flash yeah. dropped. Yeah, here. So I'll talk about a few more of the areas later, but yeah, that's where we got to here. I'm going to go up to number two in a minute. But on that night of the kidnap, uh, it, it was very, very much January the 14th. It, it was early hours, 1.30 a.m. in the morning on January the 14th. He went into their house through the integral garage. He'd already, he'd already um, been on recce to the house. He'd been in the house. He'd been in the house? Several times, yeah. He went up to the stairs. The original intention was to kidnap Dorothy, Mum. He didn't. The first bedroom he went into was Leslie's. But when he got to that bedroom, he changed his mind. He wasn't going to kidnap Dorothy. He, he decided to kidnap Leslie. Leslie was in bed. She, she's got nothing on at all. He threw a dressing gown at her, told her to put her slippers on, gagged her and put a son off, shotgun in her face. Took her outside, bundled into his Austin 1300, which he'd stolen previously. And that's when he actually brought her to here. But before he left the house, he actually left a ransom note. But the ransom note wasn't a normal ransom note. It was dymo taped, which is, again, is very very important when I've just mentioned they found the, a dime gone down there, gun yeah. there yeah so it was very very important this this ransom note that he actually left within the house um, was six foot long it talked about exactly what he wanted them to do uh, what he wanted Ronald to do and throughout it says no police no tricks or death and that was something that was in his head all the way through through this um, so yeah, he, he actually bundled her in, he brought her up to here. Um, the previous week, weeks before, on shaft number three, he'd already furnished that with sleeping bags, with food, with snacks, with colouring books. Um, it's a tape recorder in there, there was even half a bottle of brandy. So when he brought Leslie from Highley to here, 65 miles away, he put her into that shaft, everything was there. Once she was in the shaft, a wire noose around her neck, he gagged her, he tied her, her legs, and basically put her in this in the sleeping bag. So if she was stuck there, she couldn't she move. Couldn't move. She, she couldn't move. She couldn't move. What he did then, he drove another 65, 70 miles up to Bradford. And he was in Bradford that same morning, on the 14th, early, early morning, half seven, eight o'clock. When the neighbours opened the curtains, who was there in his back garden? It was Nielsen. So he's creating a perfect alibi for himself, yeah, he isn't he, he, really? he planned it all. He yeah. actually planned it all. And when you, when you look at the timelines, the timelines are so difficult, you know, to get your head around. So he'd done that. He'd obviously been up all night. He'd, he'd come to here, gone to Bradford. As soon as things were settled there, he was back down here. Mm. And then from here, he went down to Kidderminster because he'd left them a message that the drop was going on that evening, still on the 14th, but the evening... Uh, down in Kidderminster at the Swan Shopping Centre. He instructed um, the brother to go to the Swan, the two, three phone box there, between 6 pm and 1 am, and to expect a phone call of where to do the drop. Yeah. What actually happened, um, and this was one of the first mistakes, somebody released the news that Leslie had been kidnapped. And at 8 o'clock on BBC Radio, announcement went out that Leslie had been kidnapped eight o'clock in the evening at nine o'clock it appeared on BBC nine o'clock news so all of a sudden they're in a stake out here the police are there all hidden plain clothes waiting for the phones to go and it's all over the press but Nielsen hadn't seen it but the police weren't to know that so the guy who was running the stake out actually aborted that drop that particular drop yeah so he stopped the operation? Stopped the operation. At one o'clock, from 12, between 12 and 1, calls started to come through to those phone boxes from Nielsen. But obviously there was nobody there. There was nobody there. So it was the first bodge up that we actually come across. Mm. But if we go across to number two now, um, I'll take you through the next couple of days, the next 72 hours and what happened. Was, was I right in saying just before we leave here, this should have happened 12 months prior to when it did? Yeah, 1973. 
Um, in, sorry, in 1973, he planned for it to happen in January the 14th, 1974. So yeah. it was a year earlier he wanted to take place. But in 1973, the government introduced three-day working. Um, petrol was rationed or people were told not to drive. He didn't want to be conspicuous driving up and down the motorways for this, so, um, which he would have done because new cars on the road, really. And what actually happened then, he didn't decide to delay it for two weeks, two months or three months. He delayed it for an entire year but that came with a problem because now he got no money coming in got he needed to step up again in his words on the post offices and that's what happened what in happened? 1974 yep. and I'll talk you through some of them when we get to, to the next two. next shaft So we're here at Shaft 2, Dave, but before we start on Shaft 2, can you tell me about 1974 and these post offices? Yeah, OK, this is where Nielsen, as I alluded to when we were at Shaft number 1, he, he delayed the kidnapping, so he got to find money revenue from somewhere. Um, and he decided to step up a gear, those were his words, and he targeted three post offices. The first one was in Harrogate, and that was in February. The second one was in Accrington in Lancaster, in Lancashire. Um, that was around about July, August time. And the last one was five weeks later after that, which was Langley in the West Midlands. He, he'd stalked the post offices. He'd planned them, again, very, very detailed his planning. Um, he knew exactly who was going to be in those post offices at what time. He first entered the Harrogate one and he, the postmaster and his wife actually disturbed him. Without hesitation, he actually blew two gunshots into the sub postmaster, which killed him there and then. He escaped with nothing from that post office. The second one he actually went to, the Accrington one, he actually did exactly the same. Late evening, um, broke in, they disturbed him, he shot the postmaster, again killing him, to cold, he's a cold bloody killer, yeah. without hesitation he, he killed um, this guy, um, the wife actually was able to give a photo fit description of what she saw, and what she saw was this man all in black. Sometimes, some of his raids, he was in army camouflage gear, but in this instant, it was all in black, with a black mask. She said he moved very, very quietly, very, very swiftly. And this was reported in the newspaper. The photo fit resembled what people say was, or the press said, was a panther. That's where he got the name, the Black Panther. When he got down to Langley, and he loved that, that the press absolutely public enemy number one the black panther yeah i think he touched on it he he got a real kick from that he, he thought it was fantastic oh yeah he's been a failure all his life all of a sudden he's there he's he's number one as far as he's concerned he's been successful yeah which, it, that's how his warped mind actually worked so then he went down to langley um didn't get a lot away with a lot in accrington at all he went down to west midlands langley and Again, he was disturbed by the sub-postmaster, his wife, but also his two kids. And in, in this one, he actually, again, killed him, killed the sub-postmaster. He actually beat um, the wife up, beat her up to a pulp uh, with the butt of the gun. And then he just escaped. He just disappeared. And that's really brought it up to the end of the year he escaped with 816 pound i think from langley um, but then the year had passed and he was ready to do a move on the kidnapping of leslie Whitton. so can you tell me the timelines of this yeah um so we've talked about the tuesday which is the 14th an all day in the evening um on the which with the which ended in the botched um drop down in the swan center down in kidderminster he was going again 
on the Wednesday, the 15th. This time he'd come back to here. We knew he'd already been to Bradford and back, came to here and he taped Leslie. And he issued that tape of Leslie to um, Leslie's brother and mother. Um, on the tape, Leslie says something along the lines of, I'm safe, I'm being well looked after, I was wet, I'm now dry. Which some people believe she was trying to give him a hint that she was in drains. Got you. You know, yeah. but nobody, nobody picked up on that. Um, I, you know, you can see where they were coming from because she was a very, very intelligent uh, young lady. So he arranged, he was arranging for the drop to be this time outside Dudley Zoo. Gate number eight, Dudley Zoo. Um, he went down that early evening, six o'clock, 6.15. Right across the road was a freight company and he needed to use the yard within the freight for part of the drop off. So he went across to the yard where he was disturbed by a security guy, uh, Gerald Smith. Gerald Smith approached him and as he approached him, he didn't answer. Nielsen didn't answer. So Neil Smith turned his back and went towards the office to phone the police. As he was doing that, he was shot twice in the back. Smith turned round and um, Nielsen shot him a further four or five times in the front where, where he collapsed. This obviously, for obvious reasons, spooked Nielsen. Now Smith didn't die from his injuries immediately. 14 months later, he did, but he was able to give an, an account of exactly what happened. And again, another photo fit. The Austin 1300 was parked on the car park right next to Dudley Zoo. Right. In that car was guns, was a mattress, was a sleeping bag. It was all the tools he'd already got here at Bath Pool. He used to duplicate everything. He had a spare of everything. Nobody knew about that car, and it wasn't raised as a as a potential stolen car for eight days. If it had been, it would have maybe changed things again. So the ballistics went off for the shooting, and this is when, at this point, the, the bullets went over to Nottingham, and Nottingham came back and said, we've got a match. These bullets are exactly the same bullets that um, were involved in the Black Panther murders so and the sub folks yeah it's yeah so yeah so we this is let's say six early evening somehow we got back to um back to here um and what he did then he arranged for another drop but the drop this time was to be here at bath pool now this is 10 30 11 p.m on that wednesday evening where he's actually sent a tape through and told them to come to Bath Pool. That he was to bring the 50,000, no police, no tricks or death, to go to the, the phone box outside the post office in Kidsgrove. Yeah. In there behind the board would be a dymo tape message that would say, and actually said, go to Bath Pool car park, follow the road round till you get the wall. That wall is behind us, that's the wall. So that's the wall there. Yeah, it was to come there and then there was gonna be a signal from here and this is where Nielsen was originally, okay? But errors, first of all, they were running an hour and a half late from Bridge North. Nielsen, Nielsen was expecting him to be here around about two-ish, uh, the latest really. Um, it wasn't until 3.30, 4 o'clock he got here. When he actually got here, they got to the post, off, the post office, he couldn't find the demo tape. When he eventually found it, he'd lost another 15, 20 minutes. He'd come to here, he missed that wall, he drove straight past and ended up at the ski centre, which is probably a quarter of a mile that way towards the actual lake itself. Um, Ronald actually got out of the car down there, was flashing his lights, was screaming and shouting, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. But there was nobody. Nobody there. Nielsen had gone he'd gone and he'd gone for several reasons one of the reasons was around about 2 30 in the morning a car pulled onto the car park and what it was it was a courting couple but Nielsen was here flashing his light flashing his torch the, the car actually flashed back then another car appeared and the second car that appeared was a police panda car that pulled further down 
Now, West Mercia Police had contacted Staff Staffordshire Police to let them know it was going down, but not to get involved. Do not risk. In fact, Bob Booth, the Chief Superintendent of West Mercia, told them to all take the night off. But for whatever reason, there was a panda car here. And that again was about 2.45. So we did feel that this, this was a trap. He'd been spooked. Yeah. He'd actually been spooked. Now, Staffordshire police are completely in denial that that, their pan, that panda car was a Staffordshire police panda car. And they were arguing for months and months and months and no, no love was lost there at all. So the actual drop was aborted. Um, Neil, when Nielsen um, fled, he actually fled here. The big mistake they made then was that what Booth wanted, he wanted the area searched that next morning. Scotland Yard, however, said, no, you're drawing attention to it. If we've got a chance of saving Leslie, we don't want to do a full scale okay. Just, Just to recap then, on that morning after the bungled um, drop, when, it, when the light came, the police could actually see the park. This is the first time the police had actually seen this park in daylight. Um, Bob Booth, Chief Superintendent of West Mercia Police, he wanted to do a full-scale search of the area, the entire park, a couple of miles of park. Scotland Yard advised against it. And this only came out in the court case um, when it came to court. Scotland Yard said basically you could be putting Leslie's, if she's still alive, Leslie's life at risk. Because if he gets win, there's an operation here, you feel that A, he's been betrayed. So they chose to do sort of a light touch um, search with Scotland Yard operatives and they reported back to Booth a few hours later that they found nothing which is a net, again another major mistake so we're talking we're only on the 16th 17th of January here a couple two or three days after the initial um, kidnapping no other search took place until around about March the 5th so we're looking at six seven weeks down the line and that was a full-scale search and what was found during that search I've already said about the flashlight down at number one and I've already said about the binoculars at number one um, there's also the um, recording machine at number one what was found here at number two was dymo tape dymo tape exactly the same type of dymo tape and on that dymo tape it said drop the case in the hole so that was a sign also here was a spanner that opened up all of these um shafts and at number three where, where leslie's body was found there was a leather coat and another set of binoculars found so you ask yourself why how did scotland yard miss all this evidence that was found six seven weeks later because we know for a fact after that night nielsen fled he never came back here he wouldn't risk it. So all that was there was at the time. At the time. Yeah. So, yeah, Booth was absolutely frustrated, annoyed, etc., etc. Could it have changed things? We don't really know because what the criminal psychologist actually said was everything that happened that night, the police car turning up, the, the courting couple with the lights flashing, the fact that um, Ronald um, Whittle was two hours late, he panicked. He thought he'd been betrayed and the police were all over it. And in that anger, and a number of the detectives agreed with the psychologist, he was here, that was it. He went straight up to shaft number three where Leslie was yeah. saying, straight down that shaft. And what they believe is he just pushed her off that, sh off that um, shelf. In rage. That, in rage. Yeah. And go. He denied it all the way through all, all the um, court case, everything he eventually admitted to all the sub postmaster murders but he completely denied ever pushing leslie um but you know i tend to agree with the psychologist that that anger that fueled up pent up anger and that feel of betrayal led to him pushing, pushing her off, her off. There. yeah but if we go across to number three let's have a look at number three we'll go to the pathway on number three and i'll show you uh, where um, the final part of this story actually ended, ended. when um, Leslie was found on March the 7th. 
um, seven weeks, eight weeks after being kidnapped. Let's go have a look then, eh? Okay. So we're now here at the next shaft, and I believe this is where Leslie Whittle's body was actually found, is that correct, Dave? Yeah, this is shaft number three. It's just in the background there. Um, you may be able to see the, the floral tributes because it's the 49th year anniversary um, this week. Um, next year being 50 years, which is... So it's 50 years? 50, 50, 50 years, years and next yeah, year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is a shaft. As I said, all the shafts are interconnected. These are the three main shafts we visited today. Um, we won't go up to the actual shaft here in respect. We'll be sensitive and yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, she was found on that on that following morning on the um, on the Friday morning, um, very very early. Um, everybody was absolutely devastated, as you can imagine. Um, it was shocking, shocking for the area as well. So what, what actually happened in the end to Donald Nielsen then, Dave? Did, Nielsen, they, did Nielsen, they catch him or...? Nielsen went undercover, went undercover, he disappeared. He was the phantom, you know, the Black Panther that disappeared off the uh, face of the earth. Um, but by chance, complete fluke, um, in December of 75, he was actually casing out another post office. So he was going to do another robbery, was he? Yeah, in yeah. Mansfield Woodhouse. Um, and two policemen were patrolling, it was late at night, and they spotted this guy with a bag who was looking a little bit suspicious, and they decided they approached him, good evening, etc. And straight away, Nielsen pulled a sawn off shotgun on them at the police and told them to, to he jumped in the car and he told them to drive. He absolutely just said, drive, drive, drive. And Sherwood, the ones had taken Sherwood Forest, but, um, they knew exactly if they got to Sherwood Forest, he'd kill them. He'd kill them? He, yeah. He, he'd kill them. At that point, they didn't know it was a, it was a Black Panther. So they had no idea no, who they'd, no. who, who, who so, they'd got. So they took the opportunity. Um, what Nielsen had got in the driver, he got his sonar shotgun in the ribs of the driver. They saw the opportunity going around a bend he spun the car and the other policeman was able to grab the gun off him well it fired straight through the roof and they crashed the car right ne next to a fish and chip shop right, with right. customers in two of the customers come running out and they apprehended him they uh, so the public actually helped the police to, they, they to catch did. him they yeah. did yeah um, and from that point that's when they discovered they'd actually caught the black panther donald nielsen so I take it then he was tried and yeah, convicted and he was tried he was five life sentences um he died in 2011 in, in um Norwich prison yeah um he, got, he eventually got motor neuro motor neuron disease when he died um but yeah very very sad story and a story that certainly hit the locals here um, really really hard at the time yeah very very tragic from what you've been explaining yeah. isn't it yeah yeah. Very tragic, very tragic story. The question is, could it have been avoided? We'll never we know. We don't know. So you brought us to Mau Cop in front of the castle. What's this for, Dave? Um, well, it was on this street, and it's on High Street, just below the castle itself, where in 1963, a lady by the name of Mary Walton was found dead in the back of a mini traveller um, one snowy um, winter's morning. The body of Mary was discovered by a local bus driver, most may remember Reuben, Reuben Austin, who came by on the Saturday night 
on Saturday morning and saw the light still on the traveller. It was there the previous day, so we actually went and investigated. And in the back of that mini traveller was the body of Mary Walton. Wow. Yeah. Mary had been murdered um, at Rudyard and been brought and dumped in the back of the traveller here at Maukop. So they brought her from Rudyard to, to, to Maukop? To Maukop here. Right. Yeah. The lady who committed the murder was a very, very well-known Sunday school teacher. She was an opera singer. Um, she was a very, very respectable individual by the name of Gwen Massey. Now, Mary Walton was 52, Gwen Massey was 40. And what actually happened, Gwen Massey was um, involved in an event down in Congleton and she ended up singing with a guy named Frank Walton, who was Mary's husband. And they built a relationship together and actually started an affair right. at that first meeting down in Congleton. Um, Mary Walton found out about the affair a few months earlier, but did, knew her husband was having an affair, but didn't know who with. And what ha actually happened, Gwen Massey arranged to meet Mary at the plough at Endon. They met there, never went in, and Gwen talked Mary into going back to her house at Rudyard. Went back to the bungalow at Rudyard, but Mary never went in the house. She didn't get a chance. She was killed before she went in the house, was yeah. she? Yeah, she was bludgeoned yeah. to death with a hammer. With a hammer? By Gwen. And as the story goes and the report goes and police reports go, what she actually did then was pushed her back into the back of his traveller, which was Mary's own car. So that was her car, was it, yeah. Many, yeah. Drove to this spot, or along this high street here, yeah, and dumped the car and dumped the body here. with the lights on. Right. Yeah. So like I say, Reuben Austin found the body the next morning. The one contentious issue that regular, well, locals, certainly in the Rudyard and Leak area, always talked about, it was said that um, Gwen Massey actually walked back from here all the way to Rudyard. Walked so, but back to her Walked house. back to her in the, house. In the 1963 deep snow in February, what's more, she got stilettos on. Whether that side is true or not, but that was what's brought up in the, all the court cases, all the reports that you can So all that use. was what they said and what, yeah, what happened? what actually happened, yeah. Was the, was the actual court case itself. Um, and what Gwen actually said within the actual, when she was arrested, they arrested the next day at her house. Um, she basically said, if I can't have her, she, if I can't have him, she's not having him. And that's why she did the murder, was it? Yeah, that, that was right. But at the court, in prison, um, she was sentenced to life. And of that life sentence, she only served six years because of exemplary behaviour. Un unheard of, six years. Six years for murder. murder of so violent. Yeah. Because um, when you think the murder was violent, wasn't it, with what very, you said? And very, So I'm not sure how the Walton family felt about that, um, but that's what happened. Um, and that's the story of the Malcott murder. Mm. So she only did, for, for all that murder, she only did six years in six prison. Six years. Unbelievable, isn't six it? Six years. Yeah. yeah. The papers, I mean, national press, they they knew her and talked about her as Gay Gwen. Mm. That was... So it made national and oh, yes. local oh, news, oh, did it, oh, as well? absolutely, yeah. 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 And any, anybody from the 50s, 60s will remember Will remember case. this murder. Yeah. And that all happened here. Yeah. And the body on was the, found here. On the street. On the street. Yeah. So we're here in Maukop and we're on a little track just off Castle Road in Maukop and there was a murder here and the person murdered was Stephen Johnson. Who's Stephen Johnson, Dave? Stephen Johnson, well, the, the year was 1990. Again, it was Christmas. Stephen Johnson was a 25-year-old salesman earning an extra bit of cash for his two um, children, Roxy and Deborah, for Christmas, who were aged two and four at the time. Um, he was working for Scraggs. Uh, taxis. So he was making more money driving taxis yeah, for Christmas, for, the kids. For, Christmas yeah. Yeah, for the kids. Um and what happened, Steve and according to Scraggs, 
picked up um, at a nightclub over in Longton around about 3 a.m. Um, his last known call into base was around about 3.20 uh, where he picked up and he was taking an individual or individuals to Pat Moore. Um, that was the last they heard of Stephen. Um, base didn't hear anything else from him. So that was it, there was nothing, yeah. nothing else? There was maybe a few sightings between Malcop and Pat Moore. There was a report of an incident on the corner of Lordshire Place um, over towards the Dugan Partridge, right. the New Chapel, yep. uh, Pat Moore. Um, uh, two individuals arguing outside a taxi. Um, I don't know whether anything comes to that at all. But they had, they'd had this argument and... There was two lads having an two lads outside, outside. Taxi, yeah. not necessarily Stephen. Um, so it looks very much like Stephen was told to drive to Maukop, yeah. to this lane. So when, when this argument started, he was told to come here? No, don't forget that argument now. Yeah. That was just a report of an argument right. that was taking place. Yeah. He could have absolutely nothing, nothing to, to do with, with Stephen. You. Got you. Don't, yeah. you don't even know whether it was Stephen's taxi. Yeah. But anyway, Stephen was told by whoever had he picked up to drive here to Malkoff. Obviously when we look here, that person, whoever's picked Stephen up, needs to know the area. Mm. Stephen lived in Hanley, he didn't know the area. So Stephen wouldn't have a clue where he is here, yeah. would he really, at the yeah. end of the day? So this is where Stephen was brought to, and then Stephen's body was found it's around this corner, um, at 7.20 a.m. that next morning. The next morning. Yeah. So what, what do you actually think happened to Stephen then? Oh, we'd have, I don't know. Um, he was obviously murdered. We don't know what the reason was. Was There was nothing stolen. His takings were still in the car. Stephen used to travel around with a little television, a portable television that he, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and he used to take that with him. And that was still there. So robbery was not the motive. So his money was still there, his TV was still there. Yeah, that was all still there. Um, what happened was Stephen was able to get out of the car, out of his taxi, and he must have walked about 20 yards before he collapsed in the snow, and he was yeah. found face down in the snow, in the snow. that next morning. Um, we'll have a look down at the rookery on Jubilee Field in a second, where a witness actually saw an individual that very next morning who was bloodstained. We won't go around to where Stephen was murdered, out of no. respect to Stephen and yeah. the family. Yeah. Um, the one thing with this um, murder, it's still unsolved. Yeah. The murder is still out there. So to this day, we don't know who's we, done it. We, we don't know, we don't know. And the family have put appeals out every year. Stephen's mum and dad were putting appeals out till 2020 mm. and we're none the wiser and this is this is over 30 years ago. But from what you've told me there it does seem to me like whoever did this does know this area. Yeah, and yeah they must have. Didn't know where they were going been. really with it. The police have arrested three people for this. Um, the last arrest was in 2014 um, where after five months on bail they, the guy in question wasn't charged so they have been following things up. I've spoken to the police on this case several times because we did include it in the musical yeah. as a fresh appeal, yeah. um, which was with the backing of the police. Yeah. The case is reviewed on a periodical basis, which they have to for unsolved murders. Yeah. But to this day, we're none the wiser. But if we have go down to the rookery, I'll show you the field whereby the last sighting of a potential murderer was seen. Was actually seen, yeah. yeah. So we're here at Jubilee Fields. Can you tell me more about the witness then, Dave, please? Okay, yeah. Well, here at the Rookery, this is Jubilee Field that we're on, um, a witness, um, a dog walker, a lady, early morning, eight o'clock-ish, that following morning, was seeing, she was walking a dog on the field here. So she's walking here on the, yeah, on the fields, well, yeah. towards those bushes over out there. Out here or where, yeah. yeah. Um, and out of the, uh, out of the field, the, the field behind, this lad appeared. The lad had got a, he was well dressed, he'd got a white shirt on, blue trousers, he'd got a bloodstained shirt. And bearing in mind we're in the middle of winter here, mm. you know, the lady actually made a comment to him to say something like, the night before, morning after the night before, to which he said, much worse than that, and proceeded to walk off. And carried on, did he? Yeah, yeah. and carried on. 
So he was very, very dis disheveled was a term she used. She was able to put a, a photo print together, um, photo fit together for the police. And w that was issued, that was issued locally um, within the area. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, three people were arrested, but nothing came of it. The thing that happened here locally, I, I was living in the rookery at the time. So you actually lived at the rookery when yeah. this actually happened, did you? Yeah, um, very much so. And family were over in St Andrews, just the other side of here. Um, they actually fingerprinted over 400 residents. So the police were everywhere trying to find... Oh, yeah, they were find knocking, out what had knocking on doors. You know, they, they fingerprinted 400 residents between the age of 25 to 40. But again, it turned up absolutely nothing. So, to this day, you know, that murder is still on the loose. Somebody locally knows something. You know, I, I do honestly believe that Stephen's family do require closure for this. Definitely. You know, but, but it's just amazing that nobody's ever been found, isn't no, it? Really? No. So, yeah, that's where we are. Another very, very sad story that made national national headlines. So we're here at the Swan Pub in Talk Pits. What's the story here then, Dave? The story here goes back to 1921. 1921? Yeah. A guy named Walter Hulse was a landlord. And one night, him and his wife were actually in bed when Walter heard a noise downstairs in the bar area, kitchen area. In this pub? In the pub. In the Swan. Yeah. Well, but Walter went downstairs to find out what that noise was. The next thing, Walter's wife wakes to Walter shouting, who's there, who's there? The next thing she hears is two gunshots. Wow. Yeah. So she heard two gunshots? Yes, so she jumped out of bed, ran down into the kitchen bar area, and there was Walter. He'd been shot He'd twice. He'd been shot twice, had he? Yeah. With his own gun. With his own gun? Yeah. Um, a local cowman, cowman by the names of James Linney, was believed to be the murderer. Right. A lot of the regulars here thought that James was. James was very much... Um, he was done. He wasn't deaf, but he was. But he was dumb, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he lived local, quite close to the pub. They did find um, cartridges, bullet cartridges, very, very similar to the cartridges that were within um, the pub itself. Right. He was arrested, but he was never charged. So they arrested him, but he, he walked away, did he, with it? No. Insufficient evidence. It wasn't enough. Evidence to convict evidence. him? No. Um, Walter, his body, um, he was buried across the road. And so he was buried right near right where he was shot? Right across the road in the church, yeah. across the road there, St Martin's. Um, and yeah, that's that's the story of murder at the Swan. Now, I've just been speaking to Liz and talking about the Swan itself. Liz is the landlord, is she? Landlady, yeah. Landlady. Landlady, landlady yeah. Um, and she's got lots of stories about ghosts, orbs within this pub. Wow. Yeah, so, so she's, she's saying basically this pub's haunted, is she? Exactly, yeah, exactly that. But no, nice conversation with Liz, and I'm sure at some point we can perhaps come back here when we look at folklore and ghosts. Yeah, yeah, and, and let's do let Liz do a story and tell us about some of the stories that she's just said to me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Merge with the Swan 1921. So you think it, the Swan pub, yeah. quaint pub in talk, yeah. we have a murder, yeah. yeah.
hope you enjoyed that video today of murders in Kisgrove and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we did putting it together. Um, so we're now going to continue with more short videos on locations from Kidsgrove the bygone days and these are going to include the Clough Hall estate, the rise and fall of public houses, the mining industry, pit disasters, shops and businesses, local folklore, murders that you've watched today, sport in the area and the war years. And I think the next one that we're going to work on and it's coming soon your way is going to be local folklore again thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video soon and of course don't forget what this is all about kids grove the bygone days make sure you check it out in the link below and i'll also put it in the comments and i'm sure you'll thoroughly enjoy watching that